Hello, everybody. Today, I'm really excited because we're going to talk about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart in a strange way. We're going to cover everything constipation, which is actually exactly how I got to be in this seat today. And I'm joined with Dr. Williams from Modern Med. And her and I are going to go through all things poop and constipation. How are you doing today? I love it. I'm doing great. This is one of my favorite topics. So I'm so happy that we're talking about this today. Cool. Me too. I'm actually going to start by telling my personal story. So the reason I became a naturopathic doctor is because I struggled with constipation as a young child. I don't know if you know my personal story or not, if you've heard it before. I don't know the details. Okay. So I'm going to go into it, but I was born with constipation. So from a like really young age, my pediatrician would feel my stomach and be like, oh, she's not going to the bathroom enough. Mm -hmm. And I was put on things like Miralax and Amatiza and all these medications but it never gave me full relief. I never was like, okay, this is the solution. You know, I'm good. And I move on with my life. And for me, it was really uncomfortable. So I remember that it wasn't just like I was constipated and it didn't bother me. I became bloated. I would get reflux as well. So I remember like regurgitating Mm -hmm. sometimes and being really young and just not super comfortable when I would eat. Um, I also had migraines. I had some other things going on as well, but didn't feel super well um, for for a lot of my childhood. I mean, I had a very happy childhood. I'm not trying to make it miserable, but um, in terms of GI health, definitely struggled. And I went to see conventional gastroenterologists. I did a colonoscopy at a really young age, endoscopy. There was nothing that came back. Um, Was diagnosed with constipation, but then was also diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, which came back as probably not the right diagnosis for me because it can be a tricky one to rule out. And um, then I started to seek alternative treatments because it was like I had seen several gastroenterologists, been on many medications, still wasn't feeling well. Mm. And for me, it was like I couldn't travel without becoming constipated and it ruined my vacation. I was scared to go out to eat because I thought it was a food causing my issue. So I was like, what do I eat? I ended up eliminating like several things in my diet, took out dairy, gluten, but took out nightshades for one time, went vegan. Like I tried like every diet to try to fix this. A lot of it was because I was like listening to podcasts and was definitely tuning in to social media and like the health influencers of the time, which we didn't really have social media. It was more like I remember health podcasts that I was like constantly listening to and then the books that would come out as well and be like, this is my new solution. I know what it is. And then finally, I went to another gastroenterologist and I remember I I can actually like picture the room. I remember sitting there. He had my file in front of him, which at that point was really long. He's like, you've done every test. You have tried every medication. You're just going to have to live with it. And I remember like my heart sank at that moment. I was, for the first time, I was like really hopeless. I was like, wow, this is not going to get better. This is just something that I'm going to have to deal with. Um, There was also a real coldness to how he approached it, where I was like, wow, I'm on my own. Like this guy is not Mm -hmm. in my corner at all. Mm -hmm. And I left that appointment in tears and I was crying. And I remember calling my mom afterwards and being like, I like, this is going to be really hard for me to adjust to. Like, I don't want to have to avoid traveling or going out to eat or all of these things. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, I started seeing a naturopathic doctor and I was blown away by her knowledge of the body and how she explained things to me, but really also how she made me feel, which was like, I've seen a lot of patients with this, like, we're going to get you better. It was this feeling of hope. And that was the point where I'm like, wow, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. I'm going to figure this out. And so that's how I decided to go back to school and get my degree in naturopathic medicine. And, um, and then my journey didn't end there. So I still didn't like figure it out at that moment with that doctor. And for me, like the, the, the piece that was missing that I kept skirting over was the mental health piece. And so like looking back at a lot of the things that I dealt with in childhood, I think that they were really rooted in anxiety and it just presented very physically for me. Um, I definitely have chronic constipation. So even when I'm not anxious, I still struggle with it. But today at this point, I can honestly, truthfully say that like, I know how to manage it and fix it. And it's not affecting my quality of life whatsoever. Um, I'll have like days here and there, of course, but in, in the terms of like the grand scheme of things, I feel so empowered 
currently with my knowledge of how the GI system works and that I know what to do if things come up, that I feel like I don't even have to worry about it anymore, which is the exact feeling that I want to empower patients with that come to see me. It's like, I'm going to teach you everything about your GI tract that you need to know so that you don't eventually have to see me ever again because you know what to do if you go on vacation and you get constipated or you know, if you're in a social setting, like things that you can do to reduce anxiety so that it doesn't mess up your GI system afterwards. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that. That is exactly what we aim to do with our patients. And you said that so beautifully. I think it's something that a lot of our patients deal with. I think we see this almost on a daily basis at our practice. And also, like you said, the the stress and mind-body connection is often the missing piece that we need to address. And I don't know about you, but I realize that... um... When people are more open to addressing that piece, they typically get better faster. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. 100% agree. Um, but it's hard when when we've convinced ourselves for so long that it's something else or we don't want to address right. that piece because of various reasons. Yeah, I, know, I, have, I have a young cousin I was talking to her. It's Thanksgiving right now. I was talking to her yesterday and she's like, I know it's in my, like, I know there's a mental health piece. She has GI issues too. It clearly runs in the family. And I was like... <laughs> The fact that you know that you are going to like start feeling better so much sooner just because you're open to the idea of targeting that piece of it. Mm-hmm. It's not always the piece, right? Like I think with some people, it's that they haven't addressed the the physical piece or with some people they haven't addressed, you know, a different piece of the puzzle. But if you're willing to address all of the pieces, I think that's where we see the easiest change to happen. Yeah, Absolutely. Okay. So I want to go into constipation, all of the things we're going to talk about. What is constipation? It's so common for people to come in and I'm like, you're not actually constipated. Like that's not constipation. So we're going to talk about what it is. We're going to talk about the diagnostic criteria. How do you actually diagnose constipation? What are the causes? What happens there? We'll we'll get into treatment. We'll definitely get into testing that you should get done if you are constipated to talk to your doctor about And um, we will go from there, but let's start off by just talking about how common constipation is. Yeah, so it's pretty common. The range that we typically see in studies is about 12 to 19% of the population has constipation. That can really vary because like you said, the way we perceive constipation and our criteria is kind of varying. So it depends on what people are thinking of as constipation. Like for example, in one study that I found, it was like up to 60% of people reported constipation, but they were still having daily bowel movements. It was just a little bit more difficult to pass and they felt like it was incomplete. So it definitely varies, but I would say, you know, 12 to 19% is what we see on average average in the population. And it also does tend to increase as we age. So over 65 years old is when we really see that people struggle more with constipation. And we think that that's because they're usually eating less calories, drinking less fluid, having less fiber are probably the main reasons for that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Things slow down as we age and the GI system is one of those things. Um, so Super common. 20% seems pretty like accurate to me when I just talk to people. We obviously see a lot more than that in our practice. Uh, I think it's probably like the second or third most common thing we treat at Modern Med. I think bloating is number one, but I think constipation Mm -hmm. is right after that. Um, And people usually aren't coming in because like they have some weird desire to go to the bathroom every single day. They're usually coming in because their quality of life Mm -hmm. is messed up from being constipated. What are the most common things you hear people say that are constipated and like why they want to actually change things? Honestly, it's often that they're so uncomfortable. They feel like things are backed up. They have a lot of bloating. They have a lot of gas, sometimes gas pain. You know, it's just really uncomfortable when you aren't eliminating properly. Things just get backed up literally. So I think people feel those effects in mostly those ways. Yeah. Discomfort. Um, I remember for me too, it was like, I couldn't eat because I was, so, my appetite was so low. Cause I'm like, how can I put one more thing in? Cause mm-hmm. nothing is coming out. I just had this like, ugh feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And reflux, like you said too, reflux, that's a common one to coexist with it. Um, 
I definitely had fear of traveling because I'm like, I know I'm going to get constipated. I don't want to set foot on an airplane. Yeah. Um, and then definitely like the social situations too of like, what can I eat? Is this diet related or, you know, the anxiety mm-hmm. that comes around that? Yeah. The fear of food is, is a really big piece of it too. And just always like, it's the thought process that comes along with it. Like, am I going to have a bowel movement today? Like that worry and stress of constantly, like it consumes you. Um, so yeah. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So before we go into constipation, let's talk about a normal bowel movement. Um, if you've listened to ours before, you know about this, but we're going to say it again. What constants constitutes a normal bowel movement? Yeah. So we always refer back to the Bristol stool chart. If you guys haven't looked it up, I strongly recommend it. And I bring it up with all of my patients. Um, but so essentially we're aiming for about a Bristol stool chart four, which is like a snake well-formed, easy to pass. Um, and so we don't really want it to go in either direction too much. Um, so like Bristol stool chart one, two is what we classify more as a constipated. So we think of that as like the rabbit pellets, hard to pass, difficult, straining, maybe a lot of cracks in it. Um, And then we have the other side, which is like six, seven, which is like looser, falling apart, diarrhea, liquid. Um, So we kind of want it to be right in the middle. Obviously we can have our days where it fluctuates. It's not always going to be a bristle stool for perfect snake optimal. Um, It can definitely fluctuate from that depending on what you've eaten and things, but we want it to be right around the middle of that. Yeah. Okay. And how many times should we be going to the bathroom in a week about? I really aim for people to have a complete bowel movement daily. Um, I think that that is what is optimal. Sometimes even, you know, two to three a day is, is optimal for some people as well, but usually daily is what I'm aiming for. There are occasionally sometimes where people do okay with having like every other day bowel movements, as long as they don't have any other symptoms, but most of the time aiming for one a day at least. Yeah. And our constipated patients, one of the things that they usually say, and I'm definitely one of these people, which is like, there's going to be like TMI of my health journey here, but it's like, if you have a good bowel movement every day, like you just feel so much better. It's like my energy feels better, which I know is in my head, but I just feel so much better about the day. Absolutely. Um, And I've heard it from other people as well. I definitely have patients where we get to every other day though. And they're like, I feel perfect at this level. Like I don't see any need to, to change it. And I think that's a, that's just normal for, for some people too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then how do we diagnose constipation? Like what actually constitutes if somebody is constipated or not? So we diagnose it if a person is having less than three bowel movements a week. So essentially two bowel movements a week, one bowel movement a week, which is definitely pretty constipated in our eyes, of course, but that's how we would diagnose it is less than three a week. And then also if greater than 25% of the time you're straining, you are having that bristle stool chart one, two, you feel like it's incomplete. You're having to like manually support having a bowel movement. Um, Those are some other things that we want to be looking out for that would, you know, diagnose with constipation. Right. And we use the Rome criteria for this. So there is an answer of like, are, do you actually fall into the category of constipated or not? Because there are some people that don't actually fall into the diagnosis. They just feel like they're constipated. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have, or will you go through the actual criteria? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially of those things that I went through, you have to have two or more. So you have to be having less than three bowel movements a week, straining, bristle stool chart one, two, feeling like you're uh, incompletely evacuating, feeling like you have a blockage or obstruction or having to manually move things through. So those are the criteria. If you reach two or more of those, then that is constipation. Okay. And then you also have to not have a couple of things to fall in. Yep. So you have to pretty much rarely have loose stools unless you're taking laxatives. And you also have to not fall into the criteria of IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome. Um, So that essentially IBS is if you are having pain in association with that. Um, So if you're not having pain, then that rules out IBS. Yeah. Yeah. And you can still have IBSC that's constipation predominant, irritable bowel syndrome. But like you said, like those people would have abdominal pain, cramping, discomfort associated mm-hmm. with their symptoms too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And let's take a quick break in terms of going through a case study of a patient that you've had recently. We're going to like hide their identity and take away all of their information. So it's going to be a different name, but I'm just going to serve you up the idea of what this patient would look like. 
Um, so 35 year old female about, um, and let's call her Lauren for the case of this video. She comes to you with constipation and bloating. Tell me a little bit about that journey. And this is based on an actual patient. We're just kind of um, making sure that her health information stays confidential as well. Yeah. So she came to me, she was struggling with constipation for over 13 years. The constipation started when she was in graduate school and after she had a baby. Um, so obviously more high stress times. Um, and she was having a bowel movement only three times a week. It was Bristol stool one, two. Um, and then she also started really having it affect her quality of life. So, you know, having a lot of gas and bloating overall discomfort, and she had tried various things. Like a lot of our patients already have like elimination diets, laxatives, things like that. And just wasn't really getting full success and really was not feeling good. She started having fatigue and eczema. And so other issues were popping up over time too. Um, so we started with some testing, um, and we did some blood work. We just ruled out celiac disease and hypothyroidism because those can sometimes contribute to constipation. Um, but what we did was also a SIBO lactulose breath test. So looking for bacterial overgrowth, um, and that came back positive for high methane, um, and methanes can really contribute to constipation, poor motility. Um, so that's really where we started our treatment with her. Um, and so we started with herbal antimicrobials and some natural motility support like ginger. Um, and initially her symptoms got better, um, but then they started to regress. Um, and even though the gas and bloating got better, her bowel movements were still pretty much staying the same. Um, so we decided to retest her at that point. She was still high for methane. Um, and so we decided to do a little bit more of heavy hitters. We did antibiotics for the SIBO. And then we also did a pharmaceutical agent um, for motility called Motegrity. Um, and this was when she completely 100% improved. We thought we finally had gotten it. Um, but unfortunately with a little bit of time, she started to kind of backtrack and her symptoms came back. Um, so this is when we really took a deep dive into her life, her stress. Um, and we decided we really needed to focus on nervous system regulation. Um, so we talked about mind body support. She ended up actually deciding to see a hypnotherapist for gut directed hypnotherapy. Um, and this just kind of clicked for her, like everything fell into place. She started having bowel movements daily. Um, in addition to that, we did like one more round of antibiotics, but that in combination with seeing the hypnotherapist really, really helped her get back on track. Like, I mean, it was pretty amazing. I mean, you've kind of experienced this too. It's like when you go from having a bowel movement, like two to three times a week to having it daily, um, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and she was even able to stop the motegrity. And so now she just managed with the things she knows works. Um, mm -hmm. So as needed, you know, uses some magnesium and fiber and things like that. Um, so she really got to a good place, but it took time um, and it took really digging to the root of it and addressing the nervous system piece. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, a, it's such a good lesson too, where um, these things can take time. If you've had constipation for your whole life or 20 years to think that you're going to do one thing and it's all going to go away. Like, I think that's the sillier idea versus like, it's probably going to take a few tries and we may have to tweak some things, but making sure that you're like sticking with it and that you just realize that like, there's hope, there's other tools, there's other things that we can do. And for her, it was similar to my story. It sounds like, um, mm -hmm. where that mind body piece was the last thing, but if you hadn't addressed the physical things then maybe the, you know, even doing that to begin with, wouldn't have completed the picture. So Absolutely. really great case. Um, let's mm -hmm. go back into constipation in terms of what are the, what things can actually cause constipation that we're really looking at when we're taking somebody's history. Yeah. So we want to look out for things like diabetes. That's a big one um, that can affect our nervous system, which can decrease motility and even just high blood sugar can decrease gastric emptying. Um, so we want to look at blood sugar, make sure diabetes isn't part of it. Other conditions like MS, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, those are things too um, that we want to look at. And then I would say the most 
or more common ones that we see in practice would be hypothyroidism. So we always want to assess for that. Um, and then another one is eating disorders like anorexia or even just under eating in general can really be a big one. So if we aren't putting a lot in, then we're not going to be getting a lot out. Um, so low caloric intake can be a big cause for under eating as well. So we really need to make sure that we're, you know, diving into their diet recall and making sure that they're eating enough. Yeah. Yeah. And it's more common than I had originally realized when I got into practice, um, because you don't have to have the diagnosis of anorexia or an eating disorder to have this affect you either. You can be even normal body weight, but if you're under eating, it can still affect your motility. Um, and then what about medications? That's what another big common one is there's actually things that you could be taking currently that's causing constipation. Yeah, really common ones like antihistamines, which I see a lot of people taking for allergies, those can cause constipation, um, pain medications, opiates, things like that, definitely, even antidepressants can cause constipation. Um, and then one other thing that we always look out for is iron. Um, iron is a supplement that can definitely contribute to constipation. So we always want to look at what they're taking and see if that's a cause for their constipation too. Yeah. And say none of these are factors, I'm still constipated, I don't have anything wrong with me. Um, so we've ruled out any organic causes of constipation, and we've diagnosed that this is a functional bowel disorder, um, so it's idiopathic constipation. What kind of causes idiopathic constipation, or what subgroups are there is probably better worded. Yeah. So there's three main ones. The first one is IBS, irritable bowel syndrome that we've talked about that really accounts for about 70% of the cases. Um, so that is definitely the most common one. The other two ones that we have are dyssynergic defecation, um, which is essentially when we are not able to relax our anal and puborectal muscles um, to properly have a bowel movement. Um, so that one is less common, but it is definitely something that we want to look into, especially if nothing else is coming back or nothing else is improving. Um, and we can do further investigation into that. And the treatment for that that we typically do is like pelvic floor retraining, biofeedback, things like that to work on relaxing the muscles. Yeah. Um, and then the other one is slow transit constipation, which is where we have reduced motility in our intestine due to our nerves not working as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in terms of constipation, there are certain subsets of people that it's actually totally normal to be constipated. Let's talk about those. Yeah. So I really say like when it, whenever you're out of a routine is definitely a time where constipation can pop up. So especially traveling, like you said, that is so, so common to experience some constipation when you're traveling because our bodies like routine. And so when we get out of that time changes, eating differently, like all those things can definitely throw us for a loop. Um, so that can be normal. And we just want to, you know, see and find what works for you and have that on board when you know, those things are coming up. Um, some other times where I see be really common is in um, the second half of our menstrual cycle, our luteal phase, um, due to the rise in progesterone at this time that can contribute to lower or poor motility. Um, and then also similarly in pregnancy because of the high progesterone, that's also a time where constipation can be more difficult. Yeah. Pregnancy constipation is a tough one too, because a lot of the things that we yeah, have are so off limited. Um, yeah, you just don't want to use during pregnancy. So we have to be a little bit more creative with pregnant women. Um, but the, the, before the period, so, so many women get constipated right before their period, like a week before their period, just like super constipated, uncomfortable. Um, do yeah. you have patients like that? And like, what do you recommend that they do? Yeah, absolutely. I have a lot of patients like that. Um, and I usually just recommend, of course, you know, hydration, making sure you're walking and moving, making sure you're getting enough fiber, but usually people will benefit from having some extra magnesium on board at that time. That's really my go-to also because that helps with like overall like PMS and it can also help with cramping and things too. So it's a really great fit. That's usually what I recommend. Yeah, same. Um, okay. So somebody comes in, they're constipated. Um, what is the range of tests that you're considering to run on these patients so that we can figure out what the actual cause is? 
Yeah. So, I mean, the most common one that I do is the SIBO breath test um, using lactulose to assess for the methanogen overgrowth to see if that is a big contributing factor. But we also do want to be doing some blood work, um, doing, you know, some glucose, blood sugar testing, looking at your thyroid, um, just making sure that we're ruling out everything there as well. Um, and then depending on what comes back or if it's like an older patient who just recently started having constipation might go directly to referring to a gastroenterologist and doing imaging like a colonoscopy or um, to really make sure that nothing else is is going on. Yeah. And a lot of these people are we going to come in with bloating too. So that may change the testing options. We'd add some on there. Mm -hmm. Really yeah. depends on what you come in with. That's why people are just like, just tell me what labs to run. I'm like, I need to ask you so many questions before I can tell you that. It's got to be individualized to the person. Yeah. Yeah, but testing really is key and we have so many good tests to do to really help dig deeper than I find. Unfortunately, a lot of, you know, patients have already done, you know, some testing, but a lot of things were really missed. Um, so it is important to get testing and, you know, see someone who, who can really dig deep into it. Yeah. Okay. And constipation can also be a sign of colorectal cancer, um, things that, you know, are creating obstructions of the colon. What would some of the alarm signs be that are usually associated or in addition to constipation, if that were the case, that pe people should really be going straight to a gastroenterologist for? Definitely. If you see blood in your stool, if you experience weight loss over a short period of time, especially greater than 10 pounds, that's um, alarming. If you have a family history of colon cancer, um, and like I said, also, if it's just something that is recently showing up for you at an older age, that's also a sign. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the blood in the stool, you know, that could also be hemorrhoids. So like, don't freak out as well. Cause <laughs> those are so common in people with constipation, having hemorrhoids, cause you've been straining for years, but definitely yeah. still get it checked out and like know what it is before you move on. Yep. hundred percent agree. All right, so that's testing. Um, let's go into some advanced testing, though. So that's kind of like like first line. When somebody first comes to see us, that's pretty much like what we would start with, and we would customize it to them based on their family history and everything. Um, and then we may go ahead and say, okay, this is functional constipation. It has no organic cause. We're going to go ahead and treat you. And we, we would try some treatments, which we can go over in a little bit. Um and say they don't respond, which is not uncommon. So say we're still dealing with this similar to your, you know, case study, Lauren, that we went through. Um, then what additional tests do we sometimes use for patients suffering with constipation? Yeah, so the next step is doing an anorectal manometry. Um, and then if that comes back as positive, then we treat that as a defecation disorder. So as I was referring to earlier, when we're not able to relax the muscles, and that is usually pelvic floor retraining that we do for that. Um, so that would be the next step. And then um, if that doesn't come back, then we do a capsule motility study to look further into the motility aspect. Yeah. So there's a lot of testing that we can do and that really should be done if you're not getting results, um, which is so important that you feel like you understand what's going on in your body and you can go on from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's dive into treatment a little bit. And this is the caveat is it obviously really depends on all of the testing that you've gotten back. It depends on your specific type of constipation that you're dealing with. Um, you know, it really depends on so many factors, but let's just go over some of the most common treatments that we have for constipation first. Yeah. I mean, the basics, making sure you're hydrated, making sure you're moving and walking that helps stimulate our gastroclonic reflux. Um, that's really important. Also, I love people having a daily practice to start regulating your nervous system and tap into that parasympathetic rest and digest. Um, so just doing something daily for yourself can be really helpful. Um, using a squatty potty. I love people to utilize that to help with the biomechanics. Um, just making sure that you are eating regularly 
regularly eating the same size meals, um, at the same time is really helpful as well. Um, so some of those basic things, fiber, making sure you're getting enough fiber is really, really important. I usually have people aim for at least 35 grams a day. Um, that is really imperative. Um, and then beyond that, you know, working more with like the mind body connection we have certain apps that we like to use, um, that are like CBT based or hypnotherapy based. Those can also be really helpful. And then beyond that, you know, we have different like supplements and herbs, prokinetics and that we can use and even pharmaceuticals if needed. Yeah. What are the most common medications that you use with your constipated patients? Um, as far as pharmaceutical ones, I typically use Motegrity would be the most common one that I use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. use Linzess as well. Um, I'm trying to think of the most common ones. Uh, I would say those are the most common ones that I use my go-tos. I also use um, SSRIs sometimes with people with constipation. If there's coexisting anxiety, mm -hmm. that would be another one of the more common ones that I use. Um, there was something I wanted to go back to there. Regular meal sizes and regular timing of meals. Can you tell us a little bit about why that's important? Yeah. So it kind of goes back to that routine piece, but we want things to be consistently about the same so that our body is used to digesting and can also help with peristalsis. So we want about three to four hours between meals that simulates our migrating motor complex. Um, and we just don't want to be over or under eating because that can be difficult for our body to continue that peristalsis and have regular bowel movements. Yeah. So every 90 minutes or so your body triggers something called the migrating motor complex in the small intestines. Tell me what, what is that? People are going to be listening. They're going to be like migrating motor complex. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> it's essentially the peristalsis through our intestines um, to help our food move along. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I almost, the analogy I like to use is kind of like like a sweeper, like that comes through. If you can imagine, like there's like a little housekeeper in your intestines, that's like sweeping things along between your meals to like keep things moving. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to be fasted for about 90 minutes for that to start to kick in, which is why having some space and not grazing all day can be really helpful as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other pieces that, that you mentioned, I'm just reiterating it. So people hear it again is the gastrocolic reflex. So when you have, let's say breakfast, it triggers the gastrocolic reflex because it literally means gastro, something is in the stomach. In this case, it's your breakfast, triggers the colon colic reflex to move. So actually eating regularly keeps things going so that you have normal bowel movements. And as mm -hmm. I told in my story, like that was really difficult for me because I always felt full. Like I always felt bloated. I always felt full. I always felt like, how could I get anything in? I haven't gone to the bathroom in days. Or if I was going to the bathroom, it was like negligible amount. Mm -hmm. um, but I was really doing myself a disservice, skipping meals all the time because I wasn't getting the benefit of the gastrocolic reflex. And so now I tell people, you kind of got to do it and it's going to catch up and you just have to kind of yeah. bear with it in the beginning. It's like a Kickstarter. You got to get it going on its own, but you have to stay with it as you have an actual treatment for getting things going as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a big piece. It's hard to do like you're it's saying, hard. but it's hard. but it is really important. And I think that's why like a well-rounded approach can be really helpful too. Like you're saying, like having other things to support, you know, the motility aspect and help you feel, you know, more at ease with, with eating and being able to digest it better. Yeah. And that can be where, you know, I think we probably use medications more than a lot of other integrative practices, but that can be a really good place for the medications to begin with is like to help mm -hmm. with that Kickstarter to help like make it so you're having more bowel movements so you can eat more food and you can get the cycle going. And just like you've seen with some of your patients, we can sometimes get people off the medications or some people are just happy to stay on them because they feel so much better. Um, mm -hmm. But I've seen both. Yeah, me too. Awesome. Um, okay. It's Thanksgiving. So I'm going to get you back to your family. It's not Thanksgiving day. It's the day after for those watching later. Um, thank you so much for this. So much of information. Course. Yeah. It's great to be here. And we'll Love be back for this. me too. Um, we'll be back for another one soon.